Hello everyone and welcome to the Enabling Design for Environmental Good Research Insights webinar. I'm Associate Professor Simon Lockery uh, and on behalf of the Project Consortium, RMIT University, One Planet Consulting and Arcadis, I welcome you today. Also on behalf of the commissioning party, uh, the Department of Climate Change, Energy, Environment and Water. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the people of the Eastern Kulin Nations, the language, language groups Boimurrung and Boomerang language groups around uh, the Melbourne area, where the university conducts its business and across the lands and waters and the peoples that are connected to those lands and waters where you are all around Australia. I am sure because we have people from every state and territory joining us today, which is fantastic. On a personal note, uh, I've done quite a lot of work um, learning my place in the space and on country uh, in relation to my research and Indigenous knowledge and peoples. And I do a lot of work in sustainability, do with food systems and obviously design, the reason we're here today. Uh, and some of you may have heard me uh, before talk about the transformational uh, time I found out about the six or seven seasons around Melbourne rather than the four we may be used to uh, traditionally. Uh, those six or seven seasons in the Indigenous calendar often relate quite closely to food systems and the way in which weather patterns, plants and animals uh, and their interaction with those uh, leads to food sustainability. We're at currently in the season of look uh, where the hot winds stop blowing. Uh, the temperature cools, the manigam gums flower and the days and nights become equal. It's also a time where um, eels are becoming fat and it's time to harvest the eel population, but to do it in a sustainable manner. Uh, the people would often set up traps to capture particular types of eels around the Birrung area, um, fatter rather than thinner, <laughs> making sure that they're able to capture a proportion of the eels that they've harvested. Recently, I was aware, became aware of a really interesting area down Portland Way in Victoria, Bim area, which has actually recently, or a couple of years ago, become a UNESCO heritage area, where the design work of the local people, Guj Marat people, uh, is palpable, where they designed uh, a whole network of ponds, tributaries, walls to farm fish and eels in a sustainable manner. Uh, and that has now obviously been recognised through that UNESCO um, stamp of approval. Welcome anyone to really delve into uh, Indigenous knowledge around design and around sustainability. I'll move now to our agenda. So today um, we just get the next slide, thanks. We'll be introduced um, as a team and as a project by Paul Starr um, from the department. We'll briefly talk about the department's perspective on the project. We'll then pass back to me and I'll go through the background of the project, uh, why we set up a set of design principles to find how we would look at uh, enabling design for environmental good. I'll then detail uh, the methodology we utilised for this project. And then I'll move um, handing over to Helen Melissa, one of our co-leads from One Planet Consulting, to talk about some of our key results around cross-sectorial levers that we are proposing to try and transform the way in which we deal with environment and design in Australia. Once Helen's uh, completed that discussion, uh, we'll hand over to Richard Collins, the principal at Arcadis, another co-lead on the project. Uh, and he will deep dive into a case study regarding the building sector uh, to show how our cross-cutting levers apply uh, to industries, to practitioners, uh, to business, to government uh, in a fairly tangible way. And after that, we've got some time for you to um, ask some questions for us to answer those in sort of a dis discursive manner. This is a Teams live event, so I'll just let you know that um, it, it's more of a um, an event that we've curated where you can ask questions. You can see in your right hand side chat 
those questions we will um, publish for you uh, once they've been pitched uh, and you'll be able to rank those as well. So, so go on and like your favourite question and if those questions sort of rank highly, we'll try and draw on those, those popular questions in particular um, so that we know the kinds of questions that the group on this webinar are really interested in us discussing and trying to answer for you. Um, without further ado, I will now pass on to Department's Paul Starr to introduce today. Next slide. Thank you, Simon. Uh, I'm Paul Starr. I work on circular economy issues in the Australian Government's Department of Climate Change, Energy, the Environment and Water. And I'm talking to you today from Ngunnawal and Nambri country in Canberra. This project, um, it's taken us a while and it's been a big enterprise. Started from a very small seed of an idea to not try and resolve the position on environmental design for our department or for the federal government, but more to showcase the range of opportunities for Australians, various designers, brand owners, manufacturers, people in government, NGOs, consumers, to exert some influence on design phase decisions made about the environmental footprint of the materials, products, buildings, systems involved in our consumption and production in Australia, including whether those decisions are made in Australia or made overseas. So that's where this project started. I would like to thank the project consortium, uh, particularly the RMI team, RMIT team, One Planet Consulting and Arcadis, but also acknowledge the contributions made by many of the people who are actually on this call today, a wide range of public private sector, not-for-profit research community stakeholders who chipped in time, intellectual effort, and, and approach this project and its um, intent with with kind of open and generous attitude. So much appreciated. Um, a final word from me is to also thank a couple of my colleagues in the department, uh, single out Stephanie Garside and Rob Quinn for being there from getting the project up and running through to done and out into the public domain. And this moment today is one of the first opportunities to have a bigger, broader conversation coming off the back of this work done to document the range of opportunities Australians can have to influence design phase decisions about the environmental performance of the stuff in our lives. So thanks all and uh, looking forward to seeing how your discussion goes today. I'll hand back to Simon. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, and thanks for the thanks. And there certainly are you know, a lot of people to thank with this project and I'm sure we'll get uh, to more thanks later on as well. So you know, the background of this project really uh, stemmed from conversations around uh, design practice uh, and sectors of sort of great economic strategic importance to Australia, manufacturing, mining, construction, who all have links to design. I mean, design is all around us. It influences pretty much all sectors, whether it's physical, digital, systems-based, as Paul mentioned. One of the um, key tenets of this argument is the work that was done in the 90s and 2000s by the RMIT Centre for Design and Helen Lewis is quoted there. Uh, it's Lewis, Gatsakis, et cetera. I think John um, may be on the call, uh, where design was touted has been so influential in locking in environmental Im impacts of products and services, you know, up to 70%, including also high cost uh, definitions as well in the design phase. And this graph sort of illustrates that. So design as a practice, designers as practitioners and the design process has a really crucial role to play if we are going to reduce environmental impacts through the definitions, the architecture, that's um, deployed by design uh, in the product services and systems that we produce and deploy. Next slide. So toxicity, poor environmental conditions, uh, and all of the you know, acute environmental um, you know, catastrophes that we potentially face <laughs> have those direct human consequences and cl you know, climate change is a perfect example. If we do not act on climate change fast, there are going to be more and more human issues, uh, environmental issues, or and fauna issues 
uh, for this planet. And design has a crucial role to play again in trying to mitigate those issues through defining better environmental performance, uh, whilst also being economically sustainable. So that triple, triple bottom line approach, whilst we're also designing for people on the planet. Next slide. We've got a small, a short video now just to explain the background and uh, and what the project. Why is design important? The choices made in design affect the environmental impact of a product across its entire life cycle. You can choose to design out waste by making products that are durable, repairable, and fully recyclable. It's important to design out unnecessary materials, chemicals, and packaging from every product. You can design in efficient production processes that save energy, water, and money. The earlier you make these decisions, the better it is for your business and the environment. Find out more at dq.gov.au. So that uh, that video we've used now online, you've probably seen it on LinkedIn, and it's now also being hosted in a long form on uh, DQ's website. So certainly refer back to that. It's a short, sharp um, view of where we came from, what we tried to do, and what we've delivered with this project. And obviously, trying to distill a 250-page report and a whole lot of sub-reports into a short video is a, is a hard um, task, but we've tried to do it there. So feel free to refer back to that video, or use it um, as an asset as well, in your communications or your operations as well. So we really focused on the primary impact and opportunities afforded by the materiality of products and services with this project, particularly around circularity and how design affects good environmental outcomes. So I just want to acknowledge that we, you know, we understand that there are other impacts regarding things like energy use, uh, in product use space, particularly around electronic products, uh, buildings, etc. The focus of this really was on materiality, circularity of materiality, um, just so everyone's aware. That really aligns to SDG 12 um, for sustainable consumption and production um, transformation. So shifting to a circular economy really requires uh, system thinking and approaches that include comprehensive methods of assessment and implementation, which we're hoping this project has uh, produced uh, a guideline or a set of guidelines and a pathway for those types of methods and deploying implementation uh, across government, industry, not-for-profits, et cetera. Next slide, please. One of the key things we needed to do up front was to define uh, what kind of environmentally focused design we were talking about. And there was a lot of debate in the project team across uh, our literature review, which I'll talk about in a second, and also our stakeholder engagement around what we should do here in terms of a definition. We defaulted back to a simple term, eco-design. Eco-design has certain connotations for different people. Uh, if we look back to eco the history of the word eco-design, the term eco-design, there's a very strong connection into early sustainable design practice. Um, and uh, that really links to this idea of using a life cycle approach to design products that are less environmentally bad. We tried to go beyond that and incorporate everything that we know now about what we could be doing with design. Uh, and that um, resulted in four key principles around regenerative design. So transitioning from designing like to designing with nature thinking in systems and designing for life cycles, whether it's products or all the way through to systems, cities, etc. Designing for zero waste, so moving away from a take, make, waste model to a circular economy model. Finally, making better design choices. So this idea of ethical design, collective well-being, uh, socially um, appropriate design, um, dealing with indigenous, you know, basically implementing indigenous knowledge or local knowledge into design. Uh, these are the principles that we looked at uh, for this project, and there are elements of these throughout the different cross-cutting levers and um, sector-based recommendations that we've made. So I just want to you know, acknowledge this. Next slide. In terms of methodology for the project, we applied a multi-stage uh, 
approach. Firstly, we went out to the global literature to understand you know, what is best eco design practice and influence and how can we enable that locally or how can we make sure that products or services systems that come into the country or that we interact with as a country uh, are best aligned to that kind of world's best practice mode of eco design? This led to us having a whole bunch of data and knowledge um, that we synthesized into a series of assets, which you'll see a bit later, uh, that we were then able to go and interact with key stakeholders to this project. So that anywhere from um, some short, sharp expert interviews through to quite large co-design workshops uh, where we included over 70 organisations and much more um, personnel because there are often multiple personnel from organisations across industry, government, both local and state, as well as the feds who help commission this, not-for-profits uh, and, and the academy. So the academic influence as well in, in how this was shaped as a strategy. Through co-design, we're hoping that this project really has some legs with the stakeholders that are involved and the cross-cutting levers that we've come up with and the um, sector-based uh, recommendations really have a roles um, that need to be played across government, industry, non-for-profits and the academy. Uh, through co-design, we hope we've enabled uh, the best possible chance for this to, to stick um, and we'll obviously have some discussions about that later. So through this process, we really tried to work out options uh, that could enable maximum uptake of the embedding of eco design uh, in local practice for decision makers who commission or manage design. So this isn't just a focus on designers, this is also a focus on C-suites, on middle management, on marketers, on logistics and supply chain um, leaders, so that we had the best chance of embedding this stuff locally into practice as well as influencing what happens to stuff that comes in. And we're hoping that parties will take ownership of these actions based on this method that we've applied. Certainly had a lot of traction already with stakeholders um, being involved in the process, reviewing the work that we've done. There was an iterative process of review after these workshops so that people could actually have a, a say on whether it was aligned to what they thought um, we'd, we'd work through and what they thought should be the result of the work that we were doing as well. Next slide. And this just gives you a flavour of some of those groups that were involved. Some big brands there, government departments, peak bodies were key as well. Uh, it was great, for instance, to have the Design Institute of Australia and Good Design Australia both working together with us on this project throughout. Um, not for profits, they're key ones, Mindaroo, WWF, etc. as well. So we thank all of our partners for this and, and we'll continue thanking you as long as the, this project has legs and we hope it does have legs for a very long time after the release of it. Next slide. Another key part of our methodology uh, was based on uh, the innovation diffusion curve originally pitched by Rogers way back in 1962, but adapted particularly one of our um, principals, uh, Helen Melissa, and her key work around this curve, which she'll talk about a bit later, where we tried to categorise the initiatives, the programs, um, the actions that were happening globally or locally around different segments of innovation diffusion, whether it's innovation, early adoption, early majority movement, on particular issues, in this case, obviously eco design, late majority, and then laggard movement. So, how do we get the you know, the late movers in? Like I said, Helen will really speak to this when she goes through the cross cutting levers. That was an important way to char uh, characterize the kinds of things we were um, considering to recommend. Next slide. And this is, I suppose, my final, my final point uh, on method where we had a key purpose uh, 
to try and inform and engage the greatest value um, to generate change in Australia to drive eco design outcomes. We define those overarching principle principles in eco design and then came up with cross cutting measures which would be applicable across sectors. But then we did deep dives into four key industries. Um, we, we would have loved to do more sectors, uh, but we only had a finite amount of resources for this project. These um, were picked these sectors based on um, either previous movements on green issues, um, whether they were ripe for change or amenable to change, whether they had um, large economic um, contributions to the Australian economy uh, or big waste issues that they needed to solve. So a material issue that they had to um, act on. That criteria is in the report if you want to refer back to how we selected these sectors. But also it was great because it meant we had a whole range of um, stakeholders from these industries contribute to the work that we, we did. On the work we did, let's move on to that now and I will hand over to uh, One Planet Consulting Director, Helen Melissa, Churchill Fellow, uh, et cetera, et cetera, <laughs> to move uh, into our results of our cross-cutting levers and talk through those um, for you. So over to you, Helen. Thanks so much, Simon, and hello, everyone. And I'm on the same land just around the corner from Simon. So welcome to everyone from across this big, wide country. Uh, like Simon, I've worked in industry and government uh, and business, and so to be able to work with the Brains Trust that we have, including Richard and others in the teams, has been outstanding. Um, so I would like to actually pay a big congratulations to Paul Starr and others at DeQ as well um, for their vision in giving this project life. Uh, it's a rare thing where you get to think not only strategically, but in systems thinking, and how do you bring about significant change? And we've taken ourselves and everyone else that's been involved in this project, I believe, on a journey to really rethink the kinds of products we want to see going forward into the Australian uh, market, how they are going to be used, their lifespan, and what happens to them at end of life. So I really want to pay a good, you know, thank you to the team at DeQ for their vision and so forth. And it's great to see how, while we started this project back, I think in 2021, it's prescient. And there are so many phrases and things that you will read in this document or the chapters about the various sectors, which ring true. Uh, the wording, uh, so on, uh, is very apt and still very current and relevant for Australia. Indeed, I think we set the directions for new ways of thinking about product and materials in this country. So what I'm gonna talk about is um, how, in a sense, the cross-cutting levers uh, that we envisaged at the beginning have morphed into our recommendations for Australia for the future. So we've done a magnificent mapping exercise and Simon talked about the four sectors. So if you're in one of those four sectors or you're concerned about directions for one of those four sectors, by all means, read the relevant chapter. It's a wonderful synopsis of what's going on in those sectors and what the potential steps and actions are for change. Uh, and so we've got uh, a deep dive available to you, which not deep dive, it's actually really quite a succinct chapter on each of those. So our challenge has been, as Simon said, how do we move from a linear system to a circular system and a low emissions future? And what's the full suite of measures that we can use? So if we can go to the next slide, that would be great, thanks. So what we looked at were what were best practice measures overseas. And we had identified that really there are a number of levers that we can use in Australia as they used overseas. And they're policies, strategies and targets. So obviously governments have those, so also do have industry associations, so also have businesses. And they also have regulations which determine the scope of things, the priorities of things, the in and out and so forth. And there's the financing. So how do we finance and enable good versus bad? What are the sorts of measures? They're not just grants, they're things like rebates and so forth. And of course, educational programs which are delivered by associations 
or educational institutions like universities and TAFEs. So we looked at all of those and identified that the, this suite of measures are relevant for our four sectors and for all sectors across the Australian economy. And what we found was really quite revealing when we mapped those and to see where were we strong or where were we weak and where were there gaps for us here in Australia. So perhaps if we can go to the next slide. What we found by using the innovation diffusion adoption curve, if we want to get to, for example, 100% of adoption of best practice products in the Australian market, there are various measures, those financial, the policy ones, the regulatory ones, that really are required if we're going to have broad scale uptake. And so by mapping those against the innovation diffusion curve, we've come up with pretty much a world mapping of where things are applied when in order to move to uptake. So innovators, we're very familiar with the early, uh, the innovation diffusion adoption curve, I hope, and those tend to be recognized by prizes and awards some collective pilot projects, for example, but they're tiny at only 2.5%. They're voluntary measures. There are some more formalised measures that, for example, governments might pursue or education institutions will provide where they will put in place a course or some grant programs. We will see policies and strategies, for example, we have around plastics and packaging and a few things like that. There may be pledges and targets for emissions reduction or for uh, phasing out hazardous chemicals in certain product lines, as I saw when I was working at the Vinyl Council of Australia. And we have labels and certifications. So a number of industry associations have established labels and certifications for their members to you know, establish and develop best practice. We're good at that. That's great. That gets us to a certain point that doesn't even get us, that gets us to 15%. That's not sufficient if we want to go further. If we want to go further, that tipping point is critical. And this is where, unfortunately, we've identified Australia is weak in comparison to other countries. And those mainstream activities include procurement schemes, which are actually embedded. EPR schemes, so not just a uh, collection scheme, but actually EPR, where, and we can get to that in a moment sector-wide programs, so where uptake is perhaps mandatory or phased in over a period of time, where you now have integrated into CPD training delivered by associations, where it becomes more mandatory for participation uh, and around standards. So then it moves into embedding practices, and this is where you start to see such things as um, if we give, for example, the heating pool rebate or the uh, rebates for um, uh, low flow shower heads uh, of other, other kind of electrical appliances for energy efficient homes, all electric homes. This is where we start to see financial levers utilised to increase uptake. Likewise, taxes, uh, landfill levies sit in this particular position to enable phasing material to be recirculated back in the economy. This is where we see more public education. So once things have kind of got to a certain level, public education kicks in to take it from the 50% to the larger level and laws and regs. And finally, for those that still are the laggards, that's where we see our fines and penalties applied. What we found in comparing Australia with international, next slide, thanks, is that unfortunately Australia is really great at the voluntary measures, but we haven't yet really taken them forward with those next steps to embed and mainstream them. What we found, and that has morphed into our recommendations, which I'll cover in our next slide, is actually what we do and who does them in order to move to best practice for high long life products into the Australian market and obviously therefore lower waste to landfills. So by 2030 and 2025. So we believe that our recommended measures will certainly impact the Australian economy. They'll have a significant impact upon manufacturing, remanufacturing, repair and reuse. They will see substantial improvements to our resource security and our productivity. We will see supply chains that were so vulnerable through COVID improved as well. And Australia's overall competitive position 
will improve too. Next slide, thanks. So these are our recommendations. These are the 10 cross-cutting levers that we believe will uh, apply in significant ways, more or less, in all the sectors that we've assessed in detail, plus also the broader conversation as well. So what we have is uh, firstly, number one, a strategy for eco-design for Circular Australia. This is um, to be led by industry and government. Government with the new government uh, clearly has an appetite for um, strategy for manufacturing, for uh, improved product resilience in this country. They passed the legislation last year for right to repair for vehicles. We will hopefully see more of this and we're calling for an eco design for Circular Australia. We're also calling for the establishment of a task force to work with government to take that forward. We've, next one is for enhanced product stewardship, moving towards extended producer responsibility scheme. What we don't have in this country is sufficient um, um, motivation on this at the moment. We know that the federal government has, has seized the product stewardship as a significant lever and opportunity, but what we need to move to is extended producer responsibility for better designed, longer life product which is reusable and repairable. We don't yet have that and we don't have eco design fees systems in our stewardship schemes at the moment. They're basically a collection for recycling but not for product. Thirdly, activate design for reuse, repair and refurbishment. And we're proposing an actual program around this called the Reuse and Repair Reset Program. Many of our programs to date in Australia have been focused on end of pipe, i.e. recycling. We want to move that further up the chain. We want to see more funds and programs and determined use around reuse and repair, which means that material go back for resale. It will be repaired. The kinds of things that are becoming quite common, well, far more commonplace in Europe, we would like to see here in Australia and very much in our supply chains and supply chains working together to bring that about, which means manufacturers, resellers and so forth for that to occur. Link to that is the next lot, which is raising the standards and specifications for products that actually come into the market. So as I mentioned earlier, there is a lot already of certifications available from industry associations here and from overseas as well. We would like to see those far more utilised and taken forward. If we can align to phase out um, uh, toxic chemicals that inhibit recyclability or repair, we will see, for example, with tyres or others, a significant easing, lower cost for reuse and recyclability. We want to also see a national funding measure for eco-designed circular initiatives. This could be the eco-design fund, not dissimilar to ARENA or CEFC. It doesn't have to be necessarily grants. It can also be um, rebates, loans, various measures that support whole of supply chain thinking, not just little pieces here and there. Also, we want to see a phase in for the accelerate change in the landfill fees. That's to back end four and five. Without changing what we price at landfill, we don't provide the financial and economic case for four and five to sufficiently occur. It needs to stand up based on the economics and the business case. And currently, for example, particularly with plastics, it's in, and even some metal products, there is insufficient business case for us to remove material and products from landfill, and we need that. We already do it already to some extent with tyres, mattresses, they already have a financial incentive for removal. Let's apply it to other recyclable products too. Financial and regulatory mechanisms. This is a big one. Uh, in Australia, this is one that we haven't sufficiently used. And we've basically suggested that governments and industry groups re-look at how we finance and have mechanic, uh, regulatory systems that support better design into the uh, product, into the market, and to address negative externalities. At the moment, Negative externalities such as um, inappropriate design are not 
phased out in any shape or form or sufficiently, and you can still find uh, inappropriate product available readily at, uh, on the Australian market. It's not the way forward for us to move uh, at this point in time. I should acknowledge that yesterday was World Overshoot Day for us here in Australia, and if we're going to change that negative trajectory of ever, ever moving forward and moving in the other direction, those four measures are absolutely essential for us to do that. The next bracket, thanks. Finally, procurement power and market pool, buying for good. We don't use sufficiently use this in this country, and it's not just the responsibilities of governments to do this and embed this. It's embedded substantially in nations and states and local governments overseas and in industry as well. We are missing that as power for good. Professional education and training. Uh, I heard, as I said uh, the other day, what's going on in the resale um, automotive market. They're skilling up for electric cars, for more repair. This is exactly the kind of professional education, both within education institutions and in industry we need. And finally, public acceptance through um, public campaigns. Next slide, thanks. There they all are. And now I'll talk briefly about how they all apply in our circular space. So, we envisaged from the beginning how we want to move from a linear system where product comes into the market, is reused and then ends up in landfill. We wanted to move away from that and we took the Ellen MacArthur Foundation diagram, which is that butterfly diagram, and dissected it. And what we also did was we allocated who, what and when are the actions to be taken. We wanted to move from the hypothetical to the real, and to give people some real grit to their planning, to their strategies, to their business plans that they will engage on and really say, here is who needs to do what in order for us to move away from that linear system to a circular system. There's two things that are of note here. We have completely separated out the product domain from the materials domain. And in the past, we have been so focused on the recycling materials domain, we want us to move right up into the product domain in this country. We want us to move to that spot, so that point at which uh, product comes into the market and we recirculate it and recirculate it time and time and time and time again. And that's why we've separated them out. Who is responsible and who has responsibility, we've already talked about. So perhaps if we now, um, take this and apply those uh, 10 recommended levers in the next slide, thanks. They appear in different points. So as we've talked about, if we want to stop this, it's a bit like a pinball machine. We want to see levers applied in different points in the supply chain in order to stop it going straight through from the natural environment and out to landfill. How do we do that? We apply these levers in different points in the supply chain. A strategy which brings together all the key players, which is number one, sits up the top. Number two, which is for energising product stewardship and expanded responsibility scheme. We energise that at that point there. At the moment, it sits down the end of life. We want to move it from sitting at the bottom of that diagram right up to the top. We want to see product stewardship move into EPR, where it's about better design product in the first place, where there is incentive for longer life and repair and reuse. That's the kind of way in which we've applied that. I won't go on much longer because I could go through each of the levers, but suffice to say, and Richard will take you through how we've uh, assessed these levers as they apply to buildings, plastics, textiles and electronic goods. In the plastics one, the chapter that I wrote, for example, certain levers were prioritised by those in the working group and they were around one, a strategy, two, for um, uh, the um, uh, landfill levy, three for um, procurement power, sorry, for number eight being procure, procurement power. Uh, and there was one more, which I think was for um, uh, closing the loop number five. So anyway, I think that's my, the last of my slides. And if that's the case, then it's over to Richard. And yes, hoping there's heaps of questions in the chat.
ready for us to take at the end and for us to have a good discussion. Thank you again. I'll just just before we go to Richard, I will I'll repeat like what Helen just said. Make sure you post your questions uh, and um, and we will try and get to those at the end with a discussion between Helen, Richard and myself. So over to you, Richard. Great. And good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm coming to you from Gadigal country, which is in Sydney and was the uh, remote of uh, the, our three leading parties. Uh, I'm going to take you on a, a deeper dive into the building sector. Um, Simon and Helen have set us up beautifully with that overarching kind of architecture and approach to the project. Um, so, so let's go uh, deeper into one of them. Next slide. Thanks, Ryan. We selected the building sector uh, and Simon gave us the kind of the, the criteria initially, but just to kind of double down on that scale was a big part of that. So the sector globally consumes about 50% of all materials produced uh, on a national scale. Uh, it generates about 44% of our end of life materials uh, and about 30% of uh, waste to landfill, 6.5 million tonnes uh, in 2020-21. And those numbers are growing faster than any other sector. We've had a 73% a jump uh, in, in end of life materials out of the CND, construction demolition sector, over the last 15 years. Uh, so there has been and continues to be uh, a, a very material flow of materials that we need to, to grapple with. Mm. Uh, we wanted to work with the willing. Uh, and we acknowledge that there is a significant amount of work has gone in this sector over the last couple of decades uh, and there is a mature uh, approach, but there is also gaps that we have opportunities to, to fill into. Um, sustainability rating schemes, we do have the next iteration of the Green Star and it is much stronger around life cycle, uh, around reuse. You know, there's more points associated for these sorts of things. Uh, so how do we leverage that? The conversation is underway. Let's play into that uh, even further. Uh, there's also you know, those schemes uh, uh, remain bounded in terms of you know, the, the, the sect segments of the sector that they address. So residential building very early in the chain uh, in, in its evolution. Um, second tier commercial buildings, different types of, of building stock. So there was an opportunity also to uh, accelerate uh, that diversification uh, into different segments of the of the industry. Uh, we were cognizant that in the diffusion curve that Helen's presented to us, there was a lot more mechanisms in place uh, across that whole diffusion curve. So you know, we really tried to focus on where we can add value in this project. Uh, I picked out three in particular relevant levers uh, for the buildings sector. And the first is that overarching strategy. So uh, we, we saw, for example, in Denmark and the Netherlands that I do have uh, some, some targeted long-term uh, strategies for different segments uh, and including you know, a, a zero, net zero emissions goal uh, in the built environment sector. And by setting these sorts of agreed targets, and this is something that would be you know, developed through targeted and ongoing consultation with industry and across government. Uh, we can establish the conditions to pull through the remaining uh, levers. Safety standards was something that came up more specifically in this sec uh, sector than across any of the others. Um, very strongly uh, a, a conversation um, requirements from stakeholders to improve the safety standards uh, and, and chemicals of concern. I'll talk to that in a specific sec uh, recommendation in a minute, uh, but including the enforcement of those. So how are we actually making that stick? Um, and we had you know, recommendations uh, coming from the, the stakeholder community um, and flowing through into the report around ACCC, stepping into that space. Uh, they're, they're very actively signaling in the last year or so, you know, greenwashing is in the radar. But also we see there's a, a scope there for them to look into that chemicals concern and, and standards uh, space. And, and we got some recommendations around how uh, penalties and, and enforcement might be um, pushed forward more actively. And then capacity building. Uh, again, that links to our lever nine around uh, uh, continuing professional development, but how do we capacity build through uh, case studies and resources uh, and that, um, that development, uh, professional development space. 
then I'll have the next one right. So I flagged standards and specifications. This came up very strongly. Um, we don't have uh, a, a cohesive national approach uh, sufficiently of standards uh, and specifications around construction materials and building fit out materials. So this is a call for a harmonization process uh, and then also an alignment to global best practice. We're recommending a, a scan of global best practice and then we pick the eyes out of that and, and align to those standards. Reflects both, you know, we're, we are an import nation, but also the potential for us to export. Uh, and if we have our standards uh, in, in our manufacturing processes, that's going to facilitate that export uh, overseas. So both wanting to work both sides of the of the fence there. Um, Australian standards for key, key building products. Now chemicals are concern. Uh, we don't have uh, a rigorous regime around that. We heard from the Australian uh, Furniture Association that you know if any furniture coming in from China, for example, it's damaged uh, on on transit, can't be sent back. This is some of them, you know, to uh, to China because their standards align to European standards these days, and they won't accept them back in. So our standards are, are kind of second tier in that regard. So you know, this sort of forever chemicals, for example, you know, PFAS related chemicals in uh, in waterproofing uh, is a classic example. Similarly, recycled content. We we want to have greater traceability and comfort um, around the materials that uh, we are looking to recycle. Um, so both is that a safe product to recycle, and then in the product itself, that a recycled content product, do we have uh, confidence in that product. National construction code is a great way we need to embed uh, more broadly across the sector, not just the, the designers, but into you know, the trades uh, and, and on-site activity. So uh, we have seen reform in that space. Consider it, you know, feedback is that that is lowest common denominator and still not really engaging life cycle uh, sufficiently strongly. Central database for EPDs. Um, these are available, but you have to go find and uh, you have to go hunting. Uh, there's a, you know, in, in other countries, again, notably the Netherlands, the government has pulled these together into a kind of an approved database, which is going to be a great way to pull through demand uh, for uh, environmentally preferred products. And if we can do that, then that that that, that market comfort and, and pull through is a way of getting showing up the supply side, providing some confidence in the business models. Uh, and then building materials passports to provide greater transparency into materials that are going into buildings uh, and again the safety and suitability of their recycling at the end of life. Flipping back now in, in flavor, uh, lever five to that early stage, how do we incentivize real innovation uh, coming through in terms of business models, uh, support new materials and products coming through. We identified that there's a need for you know, continuing incentivization, grants and potentially funding uh, in terms of green, green loans to kind of again get out beyond the core set um, of, of stakeholders and, and building types into a broader, broader set including outside metropolitan areas, uh, residential building, etc. Next slide, thank you. It's just going to be our graphic representation of where this plays. Uh, and you'll see that the three highlighted ones are one, four and five. They are overarching uh, levers. Uh, I've kind of gone through the rationales uh, for them. Uh, if we just flip to the next slide, uh, there is uh, a, a few others I'll just tease out. The repair uh, space, uh, not lever three. Uh, yeah, incentives for reuse of buildings uh, is something that also is uh, not a buildings per se, but a fit out materials of structures uh, underpinning buildings, something that is is in scope uh, around Green Star uh, and something that we're looking to to uh, support with traceability of materials uh, and that buildings passport uh, measures. So there's a whole suite of measures, including financial measures to how do we incentivize uh, refurbishment, you know, preferential procurement, for example, of uh, repaired or, or reused buildings. The financial measures uh, can similarly be pulled through, uh, you know, levies on non-standard products or, or tax discounts on, on um, products that align to that standards that we're calling for in Lever 4. Government procurement, 
uh, relatively good in this space compared to, to some others, uh, but definitely some promotion of you know, guidance and, and case studies into that space. And how do we get the broader range of stakeholders in the building trades uh, and, and engaged and capacity built? Uh, so how do we trickle that down into our training courses and, and uh, from design all that way through to, to one site? I'll leave it at that. Uh, give us plenty of time for a discussion and I'll throw it back to Simon. Thank you, Richard. Uh, and we might move to the next slide and probably the slide after that, I think. Yes, there we go. So really what we're hoping for is to enable design for environmental good through this pathway to a sustainable future. Um, we, there are some pretty serious things we need to change, transition, but what's really positive about all this is there's just so many opportunities for great outcomes, environmentally, economically, and socially. And that's really where I'm hoping that, and I think as a team, we're hoping that uh, industry, government, non-for-profits and the academy can focus Certainly in our discussions with uh, the Q, that's been um, a fairly sort of top level mantra about where do we go from here. So um, we will now move on to uh, some Q&A uh, between the three of us. So uh, Richard, Helen, myself, happy to again, as I said, answer any questions that you might have about what's been uh, released if any of you have read the full documents, so some of them are quite substantial, some of them are way more succinct. One of the reasons we did sub reports was so that you could have some bite size information, not just a 250 page report dumped on your desk. Um, so if you've read through those and you've got some questions beyond what we've presented today, or if you've got questions about the content that we've gone through today as well, the more pertinent stuff you've covered off whilst we've been speaking, certainly drop those questions into the chat. Uh, the first question that we've got, Helen and Richard, is from Hamad. Uh, and Hamad has asked, firstly, uh, Hamad said, uh, great presentation, so well done both of you, <laughs> and fantastic work as well um, to the team. But in terms of the implementation, how can we bring all the stakeholders that we've mentioned together and make sure we're all on the same page and have a national long-term plan. What can be the next steps in that direction? And maybe before I throw this to Helen, I think it'd be great for Helen to cover this off. Um, is I, I, I would refer back to our co-design process, right? So one of the reasons we chose co-design and such a deep stakeholder engagement was to try and get as many of the d disparate and diverse people with a stake in these recommendations together to actually design them. So this, this is not us designing something um, separately and then applying it or deploying it onto industry and government. A lot of these ideas came from them. They were in the room multiple times. They sense checked, they workshopped, they discussed these ideas and so the way that the ideas formed and then were joined together as essentially a system um, was through co-design. So we'd hope that that process has helped somewhat in your um, your concerns, Matt. Um, but what I, I might do next is ask Helen what she thinks about some of the next steps uh, around engagement, around the journey, around the actions. Thanks, Hamid, and indeed, thanks, Simon. Uh, indeed, one of the things we observed was in comparison to uh, some other countries, there is and has been a lack of strategy in this area, in this country. Um, design has not been considered normally. It's around cost, the Productivity Commission, for example. Its focus is predominantly around cost for consumers. Uh, and so there is 
not so much an issue uh, or consideration around eco design and the longer term costs and implications. Um, what tends to happen and what we hope will happen as a result of this report that the conversation will now change. We certainly saw just recently the Productivity Commission come out with an astonishing um, admission, which is that climate change considerations need to be built into the thinking of residential or property assets and pricing and revealed uh, at, during sale or negotiations. So that is the first kind of shift from a significant organisation like that. We have mentioned in our report, the Productivity Commission, the ACCC and other such organisations like that, because they do need to shift to the 21st century in order to embrace eco considerations as part of the long term future for Australia for lower cost living in this country and for the quality of the products we receive. Um, I hope and we hope that the government, well certainly we've heard from the government uh, that a change in the language, um, not just since as a result of the change of government, but also as a result of the reading of this report. This report has sat with the government for a period of time and has gone through um, various halls uh, within Canberra for their consideration and the language that's coming out of government has certainly changed. We would like to see that there is a national strategy around eco design, which is why that was our number one recommendation, because we believe that that will truly bring together a wide range of industry sectors. We also do think that, and we had some debate about whether there should be sectoral plans. Um, and indeed, one of our recommendations is that uh, eco design is integrated into other um, decisions within governments and within other decisions, not just within governments. Um, so eco design is a responsibility for all parties and we would like to see this report um, really considered by leaders in industry associations as well. So Hamid, with you, with your SPE hat on and others, uh, it's appropriate that eco design is considered because without that, we're going to be left behind with obsolete short life product and we're not going to be the magnificent country we should be and can be, which are the low emissions um, and high productivity and high, uh, you know, B world leaders will end up being towards the back of the pack. Perhaps Richard might want to have some, uh, and and uh, Simon might want to make some comments on that. Yeah, I might just jump in um, as well. Thanks, Helen. So, uh, yeah, the, the um, lever one um, is a is a reason that that is lever one, and that's that national strategy uh, concept. And we fully agree, I guess, with the intent of the question is that we need set a long term strategy, and we need a national buy into that uh, conversation. It's overtly not a government led. Um, strategy that is going to be engaging industry stakeholders um, of all sorts in that conversation. Uh, so uh, the idea uh, behind that is that it, it's, a, it's a national conversation and national strategy. Uh, we've looked at models such as the you know, Circular Economy Action Plan in Europe uh, as, as model uh, for that sort of, again, long term uh, directional signalling uh, that can underpin the sort of structural changes that we're calling for. Uh, my last point, and then I'll throw it back to the to the uh, Simon and the the question list, is that we are seeing individual actors moving on this stuff already. So I referenced the Furniture Australian Furniture Association before, and you know, one of the responses that they've already taken on is they're having voluntary standards um, around the importing of uh, of furniture, um, and again, some of these chemicals that they don't want to see. Now, this is not a regulatory measure. And it, and be great if we would have one, uh, but as an industry, they've identified uh, that the need to have their own standards uh, in that space, and it will be—it's a voluntary standard. With a, there'll be some voluntary um, you know, commitment um, signalling into the market around that. Uh, but yeah, there's opportunities at all scales uh, within this report to to action. Yeah, and look, there's there's already been movement um, at a government level as well. So we know in Victoria that there's um, actions afoot to engage both industry and the design practitioner community on training and there's some master classes being rolled out at the moment through uh, Sustainability Victoria and RMIT uh, off the back of a lot of the work that's happened in the last two years with this this space and and conversations had between the project team and and the groups that are running that so that's it's great to see that there's you know there's action happening like that 
um, the individual actor action that Richard suggested. But it, you know, a coordinated approach is really key to this. Uh, and the other thing I would mention, which is really key, is that we were not um, tasked with doing a regulatory review here. Uh, and that is really quite a crucial piece of work, I think, uh, early on to make sure that the suggestions we've made um, fit either within the current regulatory environment or whether there needs to be changes. So adjustments or even new laws to enable what we're suggesting to happen. Uh, so that's that's probably another piece of work that you know, needs to happen relatively soon if we're going to have the best chance of this stuff um, sticking. Uh, otherwise, I think, you know, Richard and Helen have covered off some pretty good aspects of um, of the question you asked, Hamid. So thank you so much for asking that. And um, thanks both also for your responses. We've also had another question come in from another familiar face, Justin Frank. Hi, Justin, great to have you on the call. Um, but he's also mm -hmm. said thanks. Thanks for today. <laughs> uh, thanks for the presentation, everyone. Um, his question is, how do we accelerate the adoption of the pathways that we've suggested, particularly on the government procurement space, especially he's thinking about infrastructure development, so big projects you know, where big material flows happen. Maybe I'll go back to you, Helen, on that as well. It's interesting because I work a lot with industry associations and with business and uh, there is no doubt that so often industry associations and business are pulled into the urgent but not necessarily the big picture and that what Justin and Hamid's question goes to the heart of is the strategic change that we want to see in this country. Uh, I would certainly advocate for us to be more ambitious in what we ask of governments and one another and our associations, uh, for us to actually call for those strategies and call for the big levers like procurement. Uh, we know that, for example, the Victorian government adopting the Recycled First initiative is a significant game changer. It's resulting in industry uh, realigning and looking at what materials they can uh, um, take. But procurement isn't just about you recycle content. Procurement is also about procuring product that might have a certification. And that goes back to that point that uh, Richard made about PFAS. Um, we are still purchasing into this country products that have a short shelf life of single use or very short life uh, that are not recyclable or repairable. Uh, and really, if we, if governments moved like they do in Europe, um, and I, when I went on my Churchill scholarship, I looked simply at the state of Hamburg, which is a city state, a bit like ACT really, um, they have incredibly well developed over years, worked out what products will not be purchased by the government. And they're progressively adding to this and they are integrating that into their tenders and their specifications. It's now just business as usual that they are continually iteratively improving on the kinds of products where it's electronic goods or furnishings, carpet, um, automotive, etc. that they're um, government is buying and that's being picked up and obviously they're developing that with the Hamburg industry sector which is of increasingly strong leading sector of outstanding production in the globe not just in Hamburg so they're seeing that as how do they reposition things so um, adopting measures like that like the Hamburg government has done like uh, Vic uh, Victorian government, easy peasy. We've already got industry labels that can be accelerated and taken from being a concept and an idea to becoming more mainstream. Richard may have some other points to make about that. Yeah, just a or couple. Simon. Uh, for, for my end, uh, I'm glad you mentioned the, the Ecologic um, Helen uh, program. Um, by Recycle First is it in Victoria. New South Wales is following with a similar scheme to be launched um, to, to really preference pull through recycled material into um, infrastructure in particular. Um, so that's that's part of the story. I think uh, you know, replicating those market 
facing mechanisms. Uh, we've also looked at things such as uh, levies um, uh, and, and, and tax discounts uh, to try and pull through some of these materials. Uh, so is there an economic driver uh, to, to mm. incentivise the uptake um, of those sorts of materials? And contractual mechanisms and, and, and how do we adjust those to give enough um, time for uh, for innovative models to so not just materials but but business models to, to be able to uh, uh, bid uh, to tender into co government mm -hmm. contracts uh, so and then how are we specifying the requirements uh, are they too narrowly focused uh, to preclude newer solutions and different solutions or have we got a, an outcomes focused approach that allows solutions to emerge that aren't just you know business as usual so there's a, a range of mechanisms we're suggesting there yeah it's it's amazing just how, when you go through a process like this just how interconnected they are as well right <laughs> like you see on those diagrams justin and others that a lot of these suggestions don't sit on their own and they affect one another how, how, do, how do the incentives work when you've got potentially a much bigger funding pool for innovation versus the tax incentives for innovation and in R&D sit over here uh, that then work with potentially you know, penalties for not doing the right thing. Um, they all have to work sort of in, well, some are in, um, in harmony and some might actually butt up against one another as well, but um, with some conflict. Uh, but there there are a whole range of activators, I suppose, throughout the systems that we've suggested. And I think Richard and Helen have covered off quite a range of those in those responses. Uh, so thank you both. Uh, I'm in a fortunate position being on the board of the Tasmanian government newly yep. formed Waste and Resource Recovery Board. Uh, and these are exactly the sorts of conversations we're having at the board level. Um, no surprises. I hope that similar conversations are happening at SV and other state government entities around the country. And that uh, indeed, these are the conversations that should be happening in industry associations. How can industry associations identify ways by which to have better designed product coming into the Australian market? And what are the um, challenges? And we've set some of those out and that should be part of what industry takes to government when they discuss policy shifts and strategic shifts. Um, we've suggested that they are done on not just a sectoral line but also across the board. The measures that we've put in suggested are cross sectoral levers and recommendations because we do believe that the same problems actually exist almost the same whether it's in the building sector or elsewhere. And so a systemic approach is to make a wholesale change gradually over time to bring everyone up forward. So that's the way in which we've gone forward with that, Justin. Thanks, Helen. Um, yeah, great summation there and some perspectives on conversations at leadership levels that you know we would hope are happening across the board with the transitions that are required to get this sorted out. Richard, uh, there is a question um, from someone who uh, remains anonymous, but we'll, uh, it's a great question uh, that they've actually pitched at you, which is around the building sector, which you've presented on today, um, on whether the project considered the economic benefits that developers could gain from building buildings um, with design, um, with circular thinking in mind, so we haven't done a cost benefit analysis of, of our recommendations uh, is probably, I guess, the first thing to say. Um, these are a, a broad suite of, of levers that we you know, put together. Um, and what I guess the next steps are is then getting more detail and more traction and, and more specificity into each of those you know, levers and, and how that might work. So I think that's, yeah, that, that is a next step um, that would need to be you know, recommended uh, we have considered, uh, having said that, things such as you know, green buildings, you know, the rating scan, Green Star buildings, uh, is preferencing now these sorts of circular design materials uh, and, and, and um, business systems, so reuse of, of structures, for example, um, and the, the points that you can gain uh, through more circular um, models. 
Uh, there's obviously a much greater functional material uh, focus on materials than there has been before. You know, it's kind of pivoting a little from energy efficiency and, and energy uh, in general. Uh, we're decarbonising the grid. Materials are becoming a big part of that that carbon profile of a building. Um, so if you want to get good points uh, in your Green Stars game, um, a tighter focus on circularity and material selection and durability uh, will get you more points and that will pull through than you know, your higher rental. Uh, so there are, there are considerations that we've had in the broad, but certainly haven't gone down to any sort of cost benefit assessment. Team, anything else from you guys? No, well, I'll um, add that. Oh, okay. Go on. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I'd echo that that we didn't we didn't um, we didn't have the task um, to do cost benefit or regulatory review. It was more of a strategic analysis of how do we get there, and really there's a, a a need, like I said, with the regulatory review to do some other pieces of work that um, that give us more granular detail on what's required to get the pathway to where we need to go. I mean, there's in the building industry, it's interesting because there's, there's some anecdotal evidence that there are some of these developments going on that are um, being more prized over others in the resale market that have considered these kind of issues. Um, I'd, I'd say the Nightingale you know, series of projects is one example where you know, capital appreciation on those apartments mm -hmm. seems to be going well in somewhat of a flat market if not now a diving market <laughs> um so yeah look it's it, it's a really interesting question uh and uh, probably even more interesting in this sector is how do we systemically approach this and and, and there's a whole lot of other issues at play in you know the interplay between developers builders and buyers and being fit for purpose uh for people who ultimately live in these products that we're deploying. Um, so the sustainability questions in building goes beyond environment, probably also gets into social quite quite centrally as well. So Helen, pass Yeah, to you. I was going to add that um, what we did note was that uh, we have a lot of wishful thinking going on and great goodwill, but we're not changing the financial economics to provide incentive for good. So our legacy systems and everything that we've put in place has been based around uh, high volume efficiency, not necessarily best practice for long-term benefit, if you want to call it that. And, uh, you know, the environment absorbs all the externalities, um, including such things as PFAS or chemicals that render certain products um, unrecyclable. So what we've identified is that the decision is not just with the designers. The decision for change sits with decision makers in other areas. So that may be in the business community, it's in the government, it's in a range of areas. And likewise, the financial um, incentives that sit are for a lot of good material to go to land, for example, or for you can still buy single flush toilets, low flow shower heads. We haven't completed transitions. It's still easy to compressors in this country. There are no standards around good quality compressors and tailpipe emissions and vehicles. So we haven't gone that next step. And that's why the bell curve was so important, because when you map things against the bell curve, you see where we're missing things in this country. And if we want to move forward, we have to embrace some of those additional steps that will change the economics from easily doing bad to easily doing good. It's a couple more questions, Simon. You're on mute. Environmental, <laughs> so, envir environmental um, performance on compressors, you mean, rather than standards yes. in general yeah yeah yes <laughs> we don't have compressors made from straw uh, hitting no, the market. it's Nothing. the environmental standards you can buy <laughs> yeah. a cheap compressor that yeah. doesn't last long that leaks yeah, yeah. everywhere absolutely mm. okay so yeah we've got a heap of questions coming through which is fantastic so it's great to get this conversation um continuing so we've got another question here against such fantastic work thank you um but interested to understand 
how this might align with the federal government's modern manufacturing strategy? And I think this is a perfect question to go back to Helen. Indeed, it does. And this is why I kind of said in code, I think that the government has read this document carefully uh, and we're seeing it flow through to a range of different areas, including uh, the uh, new or the revised uh, manufacturing uh, grants program. So I think that we're seeing, I hope, Maybe we're reading between the lines. Um, maybe that's one for Paul, if Paul's willing to take that one online. I don't know. But certainly what I'm hearing um, is that uh, the thinking of the shift is there, particularly because without these kinds of measures, we're not going to meet our 2030 emission reduction targets. We're not going to meet our landfill reduction targets. We're not going to improve uh, and reduce waste to landfill. So um, without these sorts of measures, we're going to fail. And that's why we, um, we hope that these are being well and truly taken seriously. I don't know if Paul wants to say anything. I think Paul's um, actually uh, had to go to another event. Oh, um, right. But that's, uh, yeah, look, it might be one to take on notice as well for the department as to you know, how this potentially links in systemically. So um, something we could potentially um, follow up and uh, and get back to um, to those interested. If you want to contact us later, we can follow that up for you. Um, Richard, did you have any points on that either? No, let's, uh, we're, we're running out short of time, so let's move on. We are, we are. Uh, one thing I just wanted to note as well, which we haven't mentioned, is obviously the um, minister, so Minister Plibersek's um, advisory uh, panel on circular economy. Interestingly, we had not, um, we completed this project sort of back so late last year, and it's gone through a number of reviews and iterations with various stakeholders, uh, and that panel wasn't uh, actually in existence at the point where we uh, had finished this work. So it's really interesting now to see where maybe the role of that panel um, chaired by John Thwaites and with a whole lot of really interesting industry, academic and not-for-profit stakeholders on that panel as to whether um, they also have a role to play in some of the suggestions we've made um, and and consider some of the things that we've, we've recommended too. Nicole uh, Garifano has asked uh, another question. So thank you, Nicole, for being on the call. Again, another stakeholder mm -hmm. who uh, had some involvement in what we've done here. She's also congratulated us on the extensive work, but she's asked the question probably for Richard to, to have a go at. Uh, from the industries examined, is there one that stands out as further ahead or more ready to transition than others? It's not a loaded question, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> At all. I'm, I'm going to make somebody uh, no friends in subsectors. I, I think those sectors that we picked uh, were, were picked for a reason. Um, obviously, the scale of the, the issue, but also the willingness to play. Um, so I would mm. say that there is opportunity in all those sectors. Um, in textiles, we're seeing the, 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 the Fashion um, Council pushing a product stewardship scheme uh, nationally, which is fantastic uh, to, to see coming forward. Um, the Green Buildings Council was very actively engaged in the project and, and instrumental in the shape of some of those initiatives. Um, I, I would say it is the most mature, uh, as mentioned before, and, and uh, there's good opportunity, I would say, in that, that one in particular to, to really leverage existing measures and the emerging thinking in that space around, well, let's focus okay. on materials. We've had 20, 30 years of green buildings, you know, mm. being deployed globally and locally. So it, you know, it should be ripe yeah. to move, you would think. Yeah. Um, whereas yeah. when we talk to the textiles stakeholders, there's a whole lot of will and a whole and really great movement coming from the Australian Fashion Council. But there's also, you know, the realisation that there's a lot to do, for instance, infrastructure wise, um, practice wise on the ground in that industry. So look, I, Richard's right. There was a criteria we used and we wanted to get the coalition of the willing and the ones with the most opportunity um, in our crosshairs with this work. Uh, and they weren't picked um, to try and rank them. <laughs> they were picked to try and provide them some pathways and opportunities to you know, go forward. Um, but there are some that are more mature, some that are 
um, others that have other types of opportunities compared to others. And, and an opportunity, I think, as well, to learn from each other in that space. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, things like like supply chain traceability, you know, it, it's, it, mm. um, we, we're not well placed globally, I think, really, to have transparency in the supply chains, but it is emerging and it's pretty critical. So how, you know, the building sector is looking pretty actively in that space. How do we mm. rip all those learnings out to and technologies out to the other sectors as well? Right. I, I concur. I don't know that there's a ranking, but we know uh, for your participation that all the four that we looked at were keen. Uh, the participation in the project was excellent. The other thing to note is those are the same, would you believe it, we identified after we'd started on that, uh, the same four that have been identified by the European Commission uh, and the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and others for uh, or the UNEP um, for prioritisation as well. Yeah. Other questions? We've got at, 10 at, minutes we left, would have, Simon. Yeah, we would have also loved to have more sectors, right? So, I mean, we would have loved to have mining. We would have loved to have transport. transport. Yeah, so yeah. there's more to do but there. They, were, they all interlink in a way because plastics appear right. in all of them and textiles appear textiles. in the building industry and are often made of plastic as well, so or have plastic componentry in them. So, yeah. Which we made pretty clear in our in our reports. And also that collaborative aspect is, is really the glue that joins all of these initiatives together. And we've we've sort of mentioned that throughout. And the fact we had a co-design process was collaborative and a consortium who worked through this, it was collaborative, so. Another one, um, this one is again anonymous, <laughs> but thank you very much for your, um, for your question and thanking us for the presentation. Thanks for that. Um, are advanced materials being considered? being implemented in manufacturing processes, how could the government support industry to get an early adoption of these new technologies and how can government and industry work together to facilitate this transition? Maybe advanced if I materials. answer that one quickly. Yeah, oh, you want to go ahead? Helen. No, you go for uh, it, Helen. Oh, we didn't specifically look at any um, advanced material versus existing materials. Uh, what we were looking at was the lifespan of the product and how do we enable that. Uh, certainly advanced material manufacturing and so on is a focus for state and national governments um, in their industry strategies or their grant programs. So it's already there uh, and it's also supported through R&D. Right. I just yeah, add look, also that, you know, we, yeah. we, we, I guess we looked at the levers to, act, to activate the solutions uh, more than the, what the solutions are themselves. So, you know, by setting the the framework uh, and starting the conversation, we're hoping to be able to pull through exactly that sort of uh, solution into the into the mix. Yeah, good point, Richard. I think um, yeah, there's going to be more granular work now, and and that may be one of the directions for you know generally or sector based approaches, and um, that's really work to be done. Um, final question before we we close is from Stuart Gordon. Um, Stuart's asked, are there different timelines for new tech in terms of the early adopter laggard bell curve? Maybe Helen, did you want to address that? Yeah, are there um, new, um, different um, timelines? So new tech, um, certainly, I'll answer this in two ways. Um, I hope that with moving, or I think we all agree, hoping that uh, appreciation of the in the innovation diffusion adoption curve uh, for eco design product will accelerate the adoption of better product and technologies into the Australian market. I hope that the various recommendations that we have made enable us to move to better design product and recovery uh, for um, and the economic levers, which currently we rely on grant programs, for example, to MRFs for separation of just packaging. We have almost no um, visibility or much involvement in non-packaging of plastics in particular or outside for recovery. It relies on business case for uh, those kinds of investments to be made. So hopefully by making these sorts of recommendations for such things as the eco-design 
uh, Innovation Fund, we will see a significant acceleration of that here. Hopefully, likewise, in uh, procurement power and market pool, activating that one, we will see significant investment. Likewise, changing landfill um, pricing on priority products will change the business case for more technology to be deployed or developed here. Uh, in terms of product, which is new technology, yes, uh, if we lift the standards on what is bought into or sold into the Australian market, because it could maybe made here as well as maybe coming in from overseas, we will see new tech and innovation adopted at a far greater rate. Just had some Thanks. clarification that new tech actually meant solutions. So <laughs> he's, I think okay. Stuart was actually talking about our um, just our, our cross cutting levers rather than new tech specific specifically, but that's fine. I think that was a great um, summary, Ellen. Just in terms of timing, Stuart, there certainly are a range of timings that we included in our plan. Um, some are shorter term, short to medium, and some are sort of longer term. Uh, so I would suggest just just have a read of um, of the report and check it out. Obviously, the strategy ties it all together, the first lever. And there are other bits that sort of have one to two year periods for the first bit, or they might have five years for the whole um, lot of it. It just depends on which lever it is and what we're trying to achieve. And we did work through that quite uh, meticulously, as you'd expect in the fact that they all join up and they're all systematically connected. So I definitely, um, you know, suggest and recommend you you have a look at how we've done that. Um, we we almost went too far <laughs> at one point. We started started almost designing an operational plan rather than a strategy. So um, we got so excited about the work that uh, we probably had to pare it back sort of about three quarters of the way through and say, hey, we're not trying to do the operational plan as well. So. <laughs> Um, You're very right, Simon. We yeah. we uh, the report is divided in such ways that you can read a chapter if you want to get into the nuts and bolts of buildings or the composition and the structure of the plastics industry or what's going on with electronic goods. You can read each chapter with textiles, or you can read the detail. There's an action plan for each of those recommendations, as Simon says, which sets out who, what, where, why, when. Uh, so you can read one of those if you wish to. So the report is pretty well, nicely structured. Uh, Simon's re reminded us of that, that we built in for exactly easy pickup and adoption. That's right. And, and look, I think also, um, it, it's up to, up to you guys, you know, industry, government, yeah other stakeholders as to what the what the pull through rate is of these recommendations, how actively we pursue them and, and what the ambition is. Yeah, and we're hoping again through this process that we've really you know, inspired and compelled our stakeholders across 70 plus organisations in government, industry, not for profits and the academy to participate in that change, uh, take ownership of certain aspects of it uh, and and hopefully through that process, we we really do get some momentum on this um, that obviously we're getting with um, with this new advisory panel, some of the statements coming from Tanya uh, Plibersek and her absolute commitment that design is central to getting a lot of this stuff sorted out for circular economy. Uh, well, now's the time. Let's do it. And we've got some suggestions here that we think will um, be crucial to achieving that by design. On that note, I'd like to thank uh, everyone for attending today. It's, it's fantastic. We've had such a great attendance, really great interactions through the chat and the questions. For those of you on the call that were stakeholders who participated, uh, your time, your expertise, uh, your knowledge, thank you. Thank you. Because <laughs> this was not possible without you. Co-design is not about us. It is about you. Mm. And we'd hope that through that process you have you've learned something as well but your contributions have certainly educated us in a way that we've been able to produce what we've you know we've produced today i'd like to thank in particular um at the department stephanie garside rob quinn paul star timothy zirk um Ginny hoy and others for your amazing support throughout the project uh and you know, inspiring us to go go far and think big with the work that we've done.
I'd also like to thank at RMIT a number of people, uh, Elisa um, and Alistair Hill, Liam Fennessy, uh, Mark Richardson, the whole team who helped support me as I led from our side. Uh, your work was phenomenal, astonishing, uh, and it's been great to see uh, the outcomes that you have been able to achieve through this process. But finally, I want to thank in particular <laughs> my two co-leads, Helen Melissa at One Planet Consulting and Richard uh, Collins at Arcadis and their teams. Um, but you know, without you, this was not possible. Um, that's the reason that at the start of this project, I reached out to form a consortium of people who knew what they were doing and who were going to achieve what I hoped we could achieve with this project. It was a true collaboration and an amazing outcome, but it's only just started because we need to now move forward to the solutions and the actions. So let's hope, um, let's do this, let's dream and let's get it done. <laughs> let's dr dream and then act and then make a much better Australia through the circular economy by design. Thank you all for attending today. I look forward to all the conversations and projects that occur after this in this space. Thank you. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you all. All the best. <laughs>